Welcome to Our Lady Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Musanti, and we're praying together the first Sunday of Lent. Let's do that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. To celebrate properly, let's look into our hearts at the outset of Mass and confess our sins. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. In my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all of the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so we pray. Let us pray that this Lent will help us to reproduce in our lives the self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, through our observance of Lent, help us to understand fully the meaning of your Son's death and resurrection, and teach us to reflect him and his love in our lives. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so man became a living being. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and placed there the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made various trees grow that were delightful to look at and good for food, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt and of my sin cleanse me. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. For I acknowledge my offense, and my sin is before me always. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. 
Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Give me back the joy of your salvation, and a willing spirit sustain in me. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death, and thus death came to all men, inasmuch as all sinned. For up to the time of the law, sin was in the world though sin is not accounted when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin, after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. But the gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one many died, how much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of the man, one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many? And the gift is not like the result of the one who sinned. For after the one sin, there was judgment that brought con condemnation. But the gift, after many transgressions, brought acquittal. For if by the transgression of the one, death came to reign through that one, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of the justification come to reign in the life through the one Jesus Christ? In conclusion, just as through one transgression, condemnation came upon all. So, through the one righteous act, acquittal in life came to all. But just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners. So, through the obedience of one, the many will become righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. My friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. The tempter approached and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. Jesus said in reply, It is written, One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command His angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the devil took him up to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their magnificence. And he said to him, All these I shall give to you, if you prostrate yourself and worship me. At this, Jesus said to him, Get away, Satan. It is also written, The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to Jesus. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for being with us to celebrate this first Sunday of Lent. You know, um, 
The word choice, unfortunately, has taken on some bad ramifications in recent ages. You know, now choice is code language for the right to choose to terminate a child. But the idea of choice is not a bad thing at all. And you and I have choices to make every single day of our lives that make a difference between whether or not we become part of the good guys who serve God or not such good guys who are serving only ourselves or our selfish concerns. I mention that because I think all these readings involve choice this week, choices you and I have to make that get focused in a particular way during the season of Lent. And I'm hoping that the choices you and I make over these next 40 days can be choices that we can be proud of and that we'll find our Lord saying, well done. Let's go to that first reading, okay? We go to the, the book of Genesis. And what we've got going on here is obviously what's going on in the Garden of Eden and all about the tree and the fruit that the Lord says, don't take from that one, anything else, but not that one. You and I, no matter how limited our religious education, we know what God commands. I mean, it's really not that, that complex. You know, we know the golden rule. We know the Ten Commandments. We're familiar with what God wants for us. Well, the same thing is true for Adam and Eve. God has been very clear. This is what's good. This is what you shouldn't do. So they know the deal, and it's coming from God himself, the creator, the author of their lives. And yet, they're still open to temptation when the snake comes along and offers to Eve this idea that, no, 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 you're not going to die. But what's going to happen is you're going to have the wisdom of God. If you just eat from that one tree, he said you shouldn't. Now, here's the thing. We all have the knowledge of what God expects of us, and they certainly knew what God expected of them. Do we choose to follow divine wisdom or the wisdom offered to us by those who tempt us? And you and I, every day, I think, face the same challenge of Adam and Eve. Fundamentally, in our hearts and souls, we know what the right thing to do is, and we know what the wrong thing to do is. But there's that guy, that devil out there who says to us, you know, you really can have it all. You can have all the beauty of the kingdom of God, but you can have much more. You can have the wisdom of God if you just do what I'm suggesting. Follow the temptation. And I think in so many ways, you and I face that every single day. I know almost to a fine point, if I choose this road, it's going to lead me the wrong way. But I want it. But that's not what God wants for me. But I also know the right road. And I know at the end of the day that while it might not be as satisfying in human terms, that it's what God wants for me because he knows what's right and good for me. But I have to make a choice every single day. And no one can say I didn't know. You know what goes on in the Garden of Eden is very interesting to me. Everybody passes the buck, right? So when God says, what did you do? Then you know what's going to happen is that, uh, you know, Eve is going to say, well, you know, the serpent made me do it. And Adam's going to say, the woman made me do it. No one takes responsibility. But this is the season for us to say, I choose to, first of all, know the difference between right and wrong. Hopefully have the grace to follow the right road. But let's stop passing the buck, you know. I see this so often in so many famous trials. You know, well, he wouldn't have killed those 10 people had he been raised in a more loving home. There's some truth in that. But there's also truth in the fact that somewhere in most of our hearts, we know to kill the innocent is wrong. And that young man who shot all those innocent people in the mall knew what he was doing was wrong. We know the truth. God gives us the truth. I've said to you before, when you're a priest and you listen to these kids at seven years old at their confession, it's amazing to me. They know fundamentally in their hearts, this is a good thing to do. This is a not so good thing to do. It's a gift God gives us to discern the truth. But we don't always choose to follow it because we like the other road. It's much more satisfying in human terms, but it's a way to compromise our soul. There's something else in this reading I didn't want to miss. When they finally are challenged by God and they've eaten from the fruit of the tree they shouldn't have, they realize they're naked. And they feel shame. And you know, you know and I know the truth of that. Whether or not it's about eating from the the fruit of the tree or discovering that you're naked. Don't you find that whenever you know that you have gone contrary to God's will, when you've done a 180, you knew the truth, you knew the good, but you chose otherwise. Why is it that there is this feeling of emptiness, this feeling of shame, this feeling of embarrassment? You know, over the course of 42 years of priesthood, I've heard from enough people in confession about when they've been unfaithful to their wife or to their husband or to their girlfriend or boyfriend. But one of the things that comes up often is when they say, you know, right after it happened, even though it felt good physically, I felt awful. I felt such embarrassment, shame. 
And I think that's just that interior voice that God gives us, that thing we call conscience, that says to us, you knew going in this wasn't a good idea, but you did it anyway. Let's follow that interior voice that tells us this is the right road. This is the good road. It may not be as satisfying to you, but it's going to make you someone who enjoys the holiness of God. Let's choose, choose this season to follow the holiness of God, not by blaming other people for the choices we make to sin, but by choosing rightly. Okay, let's go to the second reading, St. Paul to the Romans. You know, there was a movie made by John Avildsen. John Avildsen was a film director. Most people only know him because he directed Rocky and he won the Oscar as best director for that. But he made many other films too. And one of them was called The Power of One, about a young boy growing up in South Africa who was raised with all the prejudices, the anti-black prejudices of his people, but comes slowly, wonderfully to realize that prejudice and bigotry has no place in the human and the Christian heart. I mention that because the power of one is what this reading is all about. We're told by St. Paul through one man, the choice of one man, sin came into the world, namely Adam and with Eve, of course, as well. But through one man, Jesus of Nazareth, we are saved. Death is vanquished. We're given a second chance. The power of one is what this reading is all about. Look, you may make choices in your life that will impact on your family, on your neighbors, on people you work with. You have every day the ability to make decisions, to make choices that impact on the life of others. I just saw this statistic this week that kind of blew my mind. It said today, right now, there are over 10, someplace between 10 and, 10 and 12 million children in America who have no knowledge of, no presence by their father. The father made the baby with mom and then he took off. At least 10 million, they say, and there's probably many, many more unreported. But I was thinking to myself, you know, when someone decides to have sex and then a baby comes from it and then they say, I'm out of here. I want no responsibility. I'm not going to be present in this child's life. They are impacting then forever on the lives of those, let's say, 10 million young children out there who have no dad. Now, there are some cases of women deserting the family, but more often than not, let's be honest, it's the guys. It's the daddy who doesn't want the responsibility. I never bargained for this. I'm out of here. Now, you can be out of there, but hopefully you're going to continue to be part of the child's life by giving support financially, socially, emotionally, spiritually. No. This 10 million that I'm mentioning to you are guys who have never been seen before. They're gone. Once they decide they're gone, and that child then will be raised either in foster homes or by an orphanage or by a mom who stays and raises them. But here's the thing. What is that dad thinking? I'm going to make a baby and then be gone. That's a choice. And that choice has an impact on those children forever. You and I every day make choices like that, that impact on the lives of others. And we're being told by this reading, one guy made a choice that gave us sin and death and shame. That's Adam. But one man made the right choice. And that's Jesus who gave his life for you and for me. And because of that, death is vanquished. We are promised salvation and redemption. You have as did Adam, as did Christ, the power to make a choice. And that choice will impact not just on your life or mine, but on the lives of everyone whose life you touch. So again, what's the message? Through one person came salvation. Through one person came sin and death. Let's choose to go Christ's way and make the right choice, the right choice to make decisions that embrace life and promise to be there to do the good and not desert this life, as too many dads have done, leaving behind children who will be permanently damaged by this experience. Hopefully, they're going to find love in many other places, other good people to support them. But it's a dad's job and a mom's job to be there to raise those kids. And that choice, unfortunately, when they walk away from it, has long-term scars. Well, you and I every day make similar choices to be there to love others or to be there not to love others. Let's choose the road of love, as did Christ instead of Adam. And finally, this gospel, the temptation of Christ, the 40 days in the desert, which obviously is the 40 days we echo in this process of Lent. You can call him the devil. You can call him Satan. I prefer the wonderful image of the enemy because that's what he is. He's the enemy of everything good, everything holy, everything right that you know and I should embrace. Now, what are these temptations that Christ follows? The first one is really all about stuff, all about things. You follow me, says the enemy, says Satan, 
and I'm going to give you so much stuff. All the, the wonders and goods of the world are going to come to you. I'm going to give you food. You wouldn't believe the goodness of the food. And Jesus says, not by bread alone does man live. And what we're hearing then is that what we've talked about so often, you and I are easily addicted to things, to possessions, uh, to this idea that he who ends his life with the most toys wins. The biggest bank account, the biggest house, the nicest car, forget about it. We're being told by Jesus' choice, things will not last, will not satisfy, and will not get us to heaven. And so he says to the devil, keep your stuff, even your good bread, I'm going to choose differently. Because I know that things will never satisfy my soul. And I want to have a soul that's satisfied. Okay, that's one temptation. Then the other temptation is uh, this idea of challenging God. And this is something I think every one of us can relate to. Who of us hasn't had somebody we love who's sick or been in a terrible situation ourselves where we want to get out of real trouble we're in? And when we pray, we become, as I've said before, Monty Hall. Let's make a deal. We think we have the right to deal with God, you know. We can challenge God to do it our way instead of accepting thy will be done. And, and that's really what the temptation is here for Christ, you know. Why, why don't you call on God to do it your way? And Jesus says, no. I know the purpose of our lives is not to demand of God what we want, but to have enough faith and trust to say, Lord, my life isn't making a lot of sense right now, and I'm going through really tough times, but... I'm not going to challenge you. I'm not going to test you, Lord. I'm going to let God be God and say, be it done unto me as Mary did, according to your will. So the second temptation is to decide we can negotiate with God and our way is wiser than his. And Jesus says, no way. I give it all to God. I give my life to God. I'm willing to surrender to his will. And finally, the last temptation is all about power and glory. You know, um, I've talked to you so many times about this issue before, but if you go back to anything before, I'd say 1988, you find so many Christian and Catholic politicians who would identify as pro-life. And then somewhere along the line in the late 80s, it became very clear, you cannot be nominated for national office. You cannot have a powerful role to play in the Democratic Party unless you identify as pro-choice, unless you embrace the abortion culture. And really amazing Christians and, and Catholics, people like Jesse Jackson, a reverend, or Richard Gephardt, a practicing Protestant, or we know in time people like Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, they knew and they used to say, I stand with the unborn child. Mario Cuomo, right, was a great governor of New York. They all knew the truth, and for a while they stood by their religious values and were not afraid to bring their moral values into the public square. But then along came this thing called ambition, the power and glory, the majesty of this world. And one by one, they said, oh, wait, I found a way out. I'm going to say that my private conscience supports the church's teaching that life is sacred and it's wrong to abort. But my public life, I don't want to shove my Catholicism onto other people in public life. So I'm going to say in public, I'm for the taking of life through the full nine months of pregnancy. What's that all about? It's exactly what the devil is talking about here. I'm going to give you all the power of the world. That's what we offer. I mean, at the end of the day, President Biden can stand before God and say, I got to be elected president of the United States. Nancy Pelosi can say, I got to be Speaker of the House, the first woman to have that position. We had power, real earthly power. And can you imagine the response of our Lord and God? And that stuff, that earthly power doesn't matter a whole lot up here. What matters is, did you know the truth? Did you live the truth? Were you proud enough to tell the truth in season and out of season? You know, I use the example of, of the, the right to life issue, but in so many ways, there are so many temptations on earth. Where we can have all the power, all the glory, all the authority over other people, or we can do it God's way and say, I'm not interested in the power. I know all power passes. I know whatever authority I have in human terms will die with me. But the stuff that lasts is the good I chose to represent and not apologize for, but to be true to what I knew in my heart and soul is right and good. You know, I'm always reminded of that powerful passage. People say to me sometimes on the issue of the right to life, well, you know, you're not going to find anywhere in the gospel even the word abortion. So there's no teaching on abortion. 
And I like to remind them of the passage where Jesus says, woe to him who hurts the little ones. Better a millstone should be tied around his neck and be thrown into a river than to hurt the little ones. Well, if those unborn girls and boys are not the little ones, I don't know who is. So no, the word abortion is never mentioned in the gospel, but the teaching of Christ is clear and it's known in the heart of every one of us, whether you're president or just the regular guy living in your neighborhood and we're called on with Jesus not to give in to the temptation to be transformed or in any way arrested by the powers of this world, but to invest in the power to come, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, finally, I want to say, if I can, just uh, another word, and then I promise I'll end this homily. Um, we had for over three decades a wonderful priest here at Our Lady of Lords, Father Tony Heinlein, and uh, this week he went home to God. And he is what probably many of you, I think, are. You're people who look at the world and how it's changed in your lifetime, and, and you just can't figure out, like, has the world gone mad? You know, things that we once knew with clarity, very much the readings of today, and we believed in, suddenly the world says, oh, that's not so important. Uh, no one really knows what's right from what's wrong. We've gotten into this relativistic morality. And what I loved, I love many things about Father Tony Heinlein, but he learned a long time ago God's truth, and he held fast. And he didn't believe that, you know, well, the culture has changed, and so our values have to change with the culture. He knew better. He knew that eternal truth is eternal and forever truth. And he stayed faithful to that truth. And it put him very much out of step with many currents in our society today. But I'm pretty certain that right now, Father Tony Heinlein is standing before a God who says, you didn't sell out. You didn't give in. You didn't go along to get along. You didn't do what was popular. You did what was right as I gave you the vision to see. Thank you, Father Tony, for your faithfulness now come and enter the kingdom which has been prepared for you. We can all learn, every one of us, from Father Tony's witness about being faithful and true. Values that last, last forever, and they don't change whatever the society says. What's true, as God gives us the vision to see, is true now and forever. Father Tony knew that. Tony Heinlein, wonderful priest, wonderful Catholic Christian, rest in peace. As a people of faith, now let's profess together our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with confidence in, in God's power and love for us, let's offer our prayers and petition. And the response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That the gospel message of salvation in Jesus Christ may reach every person on earth. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. That world leaders may never be deceived by the empty promises of power and earthly glory, but rather may keep their hearts focused on God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That all may reject the temptation to be like gods who have mastery over human life and instead <laughs> may accept and reverence life as a supreme gift of the Creator, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Anthony Di Giovanni, baby Mia Scats, Eddie and Lisa Del Campo, Bobby Stokel, Bob Andruzzi, Muriel Richards, Marie Tenay, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer.
for all who have died, especially Father Tony Heinlein, Kenneth Veltri, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the intention of this Mass, for Dr. Louis Marino, Roberto Borzoni, James and Ann Spinella, Lucy Terulli, John Langren, Buddy Ferrari, Richard Jennings, and Paul Struzieri, whom we remember at this Eucharist, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let me add some intentions, of course. The tragedy in Turkey and Syria continues. We pray for people of compassion around the world to reach out to those who have lost homes and family. We pray for the thousands who have died or been maimed by the earthquakes and for the well-being of the people there. I also want to, among the sick, pray for uh, Annette Romance, for Peter Raber. I pray for Baby Oakley and Justin Doherty. pray for Mary and Pat Sears. I pray as well for Dario Rivera, for Carol Paula Ashandi, for the Paratine family, for Angelo, Al, and Ange and for Angelo, Al, and Bridget Clementi, for Leanne Lasanti, for Katie O'Connor. I pray for my mom, Cecilia, as well as for Judy Alaco. I pray for all prisoners of conscience, those who are suffering because of their belief in freedom, especially Jimmy Lay and Cardinal Zen. I pray too for all of those who are oppressed. Let me pray for Larry Lewis and Millie Paradiso, for Patricia Stewart and Ursula Vobis, for Connie Vanas and Maria Cariola. I pray for the family of George, George Ann, Vol Walder. I pray for the McShea family. Let me pray for my old friend, Dominic Macchio, who's fighting a brave battle with cancer. I pray as well for Judge Tony Falanga, for baby Mia. I pray for Joanna Car Cavaccini, for Tim Moore, for Kimberly Cusack, for Michael Chanover. I pray for Christine Bauman, as well as for Jeanette Chanover, Carol Silva, Joe Falgiano. Pray for Kathy Bordengo and for Nancy Doherty, for Tom Miller, for Paul and Pat's daughter-in-law out in California. I pray for Courtney Genovese, as well as for Maria, who's suffering from those herniated discs. I pray for the continued recovery of Tom Sedita, as well as for Joseph Grafeo. Pray for, um, for Susan Mulligan. I want to pray for Vilio Bronzini and uh, for uh, Nicholas Delario. Pray for Andy Stefano, Anita Rinaldo, An Anita Rinaldi, as well as Courtney Desjardins. I pray for Tommy Swingross, my friend in Virginia, as well as for Mary and Ken Johnson and family, for Patrick Cuccius, for Elizabeth Carter, for uh, Stacy Misch. Pray as well for Sam and Beverly Maggio. And I pray for Joan Kratz and her son and for Russell Castri Giovanni, all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. And then I wanna pray for those who have died. Uh, I wanna pray for um, Chris O'Brien, as well as Mary and his sister. I wanna pray for Doug Julik. Let me pray too for my dad, Nicholas. For Dennis Cooney, who passed away in the last week. We've been praying for him on the sick list. He's gone home to God. Pray for Sophia Maglione, for Kenneth and Marie Taylor. Pray for Nicholas Marini, as well for Corinne, Caracciolo, for Luigi Antonio Rosmini, for Gemma Stumpa Rosmini, for Mike Goff, and for Steve O'Mara, for John Slade, for Kristen Sedita Duggan, for Tom O'Sullivan, for Diego Rivera. I pray for the deceased members of the Vignardi family, as well as Susie and Vinny. Pray for Bartolomeo Beni, Guy Gaetano Salvatore and Angelo Emilo, for Anna and Gary Gomes, for Albert Covelli, for Paul Struzieri, I pray for Emilio Alaca, as well as for Helen, Luke, and John Marr. Let me pray for Pat and George Layton, for Ursula, Jack, and Paul Cronin, for Kay and Mike Lynch, for Doris and Hank Erickson. Among those who have died, I remember my old friend, Jack Carroll, and his son-in-law, Dave Robin. Pray for Christina Formato. Pray for Tom O'Sullivan, for Billy and Michael Sarasoli, for Ryan and Tom, I want to pray for Mary and Joseph William, for Kathy Orofino, Margaret O'Connell Asante, for Kenny Bolando, for John, Maureen, Ann, Ed, and Mary Raber, for Monica and Ray Carrison. I pray for Richard Rosmarin and Jimmy Soldo, for Carmela Labolita, Cynthia Prague, Elaine Tiso, Matthew Toriello, Joseph Sardone, and Bessie Sena. I pray for Bill Kelly. I wonder what my friend Bill Kelly would think of the current very political FBI. He was a great FBI guy. I pray for Isabel Glauda, 
for Pauline, Irene, and Tom Romano, Ed June and Eddie Jandavis, Father Don Babinski, Father Joe Lukaszewski, Father Ken Marks, Father Tim Hurton, Father Ken Winkler. Pray for Marie Socolo, for Gerard Granito, for Marie and Albert Cavelli, for Peggy and Richard DeMarco, my friend Corinne Locke. I pray for Melissa Bergman and Joseph Pavone and Nick Martone. Pray for John Bonifacio, Jerry Monk. Pray for uh, Jean and Nicholas Delario, for Colin and Tommy Ryan, for Nancy Palumbo and Elaine Tiso and John Slade and Helen Kiddash. I pray as well for Catherine Cheney, for William Anthony Bruheiler, as well as Teresa D. Palmer, also known as Tessie. Pray for Annette Cilantro, as well as Charlie McLaughlin, and for Jean Hersick. And I think I got that one name for Annette wrong. And uh, Annette, you're in heaven. You know what I meant by that. I want to add a few that I just got. I want to pray for Marie Iannone on the anniversary of her one year in heaven, uh, for George Cardona, who's uh, Ann Lucci, Lu Lucci's brother-in-law. I want to pray as well for your intention and mine, and also keep in mind our first responders, our police and firefighters and EMTs. I want to pray for all of our men and women in the armed forces. I want to pray for our, our friends in Ukraine and their valiant battle against Russia. I want to pray for a change of heart and mind in the leaders of China and Russia and Iran so that they'll choose the ways of peace instead. I want to pray too for doctors and nurses and orderlies and all those who try to keep us healthy. And I want to end this part of our prayer by taking all of these intentions, yours and mine as well, and offering them to the Mother of God, our patroness, as together we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed, Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord God, make us worthy to bring you these gifts, and may this holy sacrifice help to change our lives for the good. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we dwell always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, who is our brother and our Lord. His fast of 40 days makes this holy season a season of self-denial. By rejecting the devil's temptations, he's taught us to rid ourselves of the hidden corruption of evil and so to share his paschal meal in purity of heart through the decisions, the choices we make. Until that time, we come to fulfillment in the promised land of heaven. So now, with all the angels and the saints in heaven, we join as they sing their unending hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of power and might, we praise you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who comes in your name. He is the word that brings salvation. He's the hand you stretch out to us who are sinners. He's the way that leads to your peace. 
God, our Heavenly Father, we've often wandered far from you, but through your Son, Jesus, you have brought us back. You gave him up to death so that we might turn again to you and find our way in love to one another. Therefore, we celebrate today the love and reconciliation Christ has gained for us, and we ask you, Father, to sanctify these gifts by the power of the Holy Spirit so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. While he was at supper, on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and gave you, Father, thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends. And he said, take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Lord our God, your Son has entrusted to us this pledge of his love. We celebrate the memory of his death and resurrection and we bring you the gift you've given to us, this sacrifice of love and reconciliation. Therefore, we ask you, Father, to accept us together with your Son. Fill us with his Spirit through our sharing in this meal, and may he take away all that divides us. May the same Spirit of love keep us always in communion of mind and heart with Francis, our Pope, with John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. Father, make your church throughout the world a sign of unity and an instrument of your peace. You've gathered us here today around the table of your son in fellowship with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her devoted spouse, and all the saints. In that new world, where the fullness of your peace will be revealed, gather people of every race, every language, every way of life to share in the one eternal banquet with Jesus Christ, who is our risen and our loving Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. We all get to make choices every single day down the right path or the wrong path. God gives us the grace to decide. He gives us the free will to decide. I hope this Lent and throughout the year, you and I choose wisely. For that grace, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. With your the Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ Bring us all to share in everlasting life. our spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you, amen. Not too much to announce today, except that, you know, we talk about all the time doing your Easter duty. And what that comes down to is, while you should go to confession when you need to go because you've sinned and who of us hasn't, the Easter duty is a reminder that by the time of Easter, we should have someplace in the past year gotten to confession. Now, I know and every priest knows that uh, there are so many people out there who say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been years since my last confession. So, I'd say the majority of Catholics probably don't do their Easter duty. So let this be an announcement and a reminder that there's no time like these 40 days of Lent to go to confession and to make our Easter duty. You know and I know that it's practically impossible, unless you're truly a saint, to get through one year without sin. So no one can say, well, if I had some sins, I'd go. We all have sin. And this is the season to say, I'm going to make time, think about what I've done in my life, what's right, what's wrong and bring that which is wrong to the sacrament of confession. We are so blessed to have this sacrament, but it's of no value unless we use it like any great gift. The Protestant psychoanalyst Eric Erickson said long ago in one of his books that the Catholic Church is about 500 years ahead of most other Christian denominations in that it gives its members a necessary opportunity to articulate sin and guilt, and that that's a very healthy thing to do. There's a reason The billion dollar industry of therapy exists because people need to talk to people about the things in their life. Well, guess what? For free, you get to go to a guy who will listen to you and wants to take away the burden of sin and let you be free from that. So use it. And I'm not talking just about those few days before Easter when everyone crashes into go to confession. But go now. We've got 40 days. Go this week or go next week. But use this incredible sacrament, this great gift that Protestant psychoanalyst Eric Erickson said we are specially gifted to have in the Catholic Church. As always, I invite you to be with us on Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Either listen to it on Sirius XM Channel 129, the Catholic Channel, or just go to your computer and punch in Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti on YouTube. This week, I mentioned last week, great guest. Some people think that only Catholics or Christians are pro-life. So we have a county executive of this huge county in New York, a guy named Bruce Blakeman, who's uh, been elected county executive and says unapologetically, I'm pro-life. I just know that it's wrong to take the life of a child in the womb. And that's just one of many values he shares with us that are really good, solid values. So Bruce Blakeman, county executive of Nassau County, a big multi-million 
uh, number of people living in Nassau County. And those of you who never heard of it, it's, it's quite a place to live. It's where we live and it's where our parish is. But uh, listen to Bruce Blakeman and much of the wisdom that he offers on personally speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti. My friends, let's pray. Father, increase our faith and our hope and our love and deepen the love we have, especially for communion and the sacraments. Help us to live by your divine words and to see Christ, our bread of life, he who truly is our Lord forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Again we keep this solemn fast, a gift of faith from ages past. This light which binds us lovingly to faith and hope and charity.